Welcome back to Age of Empires 2. Last time, we fought what could pretty much be described as our first real battle. This time, we move on into the more unique game mechanics of this game. This is the scenario that the manual recommends you start with if you're already familiar with, with either Age of Empires 1 or real-time strategy games in general. So, let's go ahead and um, try Forge an Alliance. Our coffers were depleted at the Battle of Stirling. So we need to strengthen our economy once again before pushing south into lands held by the English. We need to construct the market and establish trade routes to the villages of friendly clans. Local legends speak of three sacred relics hidden south of Stirling. Acquiring these artifacts for Wallace's army will be a great boost to Scottish morale. So, as we learned um, in that intro, this is going to be more of an economic-based mission in a way. But there is some uh, military stuff here too, so again, this is another one of those where you kind of put all your skills together. Our objective here is to capture three relics and garrison them inside our monastery. So, relics, monastery, you're probably thinking, what does that mean? Well, yeah, we haven't actually been introduced to those yet, and we're about to. If you check the hints tab here, yeah, this mentions that um, this scenario uses the Advanced Commands interface. Now, the thing is, I've always had the Advanced Commands interface on, and you pretty much always will too if, you've, if you're um, you know, an advanced player. For some reason, these were kind of on by default when I had this. Normally, you have to turn them on in like the options, but these seem to be on by default in mine, so um, yeah. And this thing says if you lose your monks, you can make more when you get to the castle age. We'll find out what that means in a bit. The Scottish army has been rallied by recent victories against the English. The situation's starting to look up. Did you know that there are three different modes for the minimap in the lower right corner of the screen? Hmm? You can show only military units or only resources and trade units by clicking the buttons just below and to the right of the minimap. It will help the morale of our army to collect holy relics and place them in our monastery. One of the relics is close to your town. An ally has another relic. The English have captured another. You can retrieve a relic by clicking a monk and right-clicking the relic. Monks have other abilities as well. They can heal your injured soldiers or those of your allies. They can also attempt to convert enemy soldiers to join your army. So, that was an awful lot of explanation to get out of the way, but anyway, the buttons that change the minimap mode are these ones right here that I'm currently pointing at. I'm currently on the normal minimap option, which is everything. This here is the economic minimap, which only shows uh, resources and trade units, like they said, which um, isn't showing very much. And this here is the military minimap that only shows military units. So, it just depends on what you want to keep track of at the time. Farms are a good source of food once you've exhausted forage bushes and animals. Farms are built like buildings and must be periodically rebuilt. To gather food from a farm, click a villager, then right-click a farm. Kind of funny they're only explaining this to you now when um, earlier on they actually recommended that you go farming, but yes, this here is a farm. As you can see, it contains 175 food. We can order a villager to go farm from it by just doing this as normal. Now, the villager, we already have a couple of villagers starting to farm, so yes, they'll gather food from it and bring it to the nearest mill or town centre. Now, when a farm runs out of food, it turns into an expired farm, which is basically useless, but... If you right-click on an expired farm, the villager will replant it. However, replanting a farm costs exactly as much as building a new one. And building a new farm costs 60 wood. I'm guessing that represents plant seeds or something, I don't know. But, the Conqueror's expansion added an extremely handy nice feature. have allies on the map. Your ally, the Yellow Fire, can help you fight the enemy. You can also trade with your allies. To trade, you'll need to build a market. Okay, they're talking about trading with allies. We'll get into that later. But here's the really, really amazing new feature. The mill here has this thing called Reseed Farm. Now, this costs exactly as much as replanting an expired farm, and really, you don't really benefit... There's no real main benefit to this. You'll still be paying the same amount of wood you would normally. 
it's just so much more convenient. If we do this, this adds one farm to the replant queue. This means that when a farm runs out of food, the villagers will automatically replant it for you. This helps so much, so convenient, because in the vanilla Age of Kings, you pretty much had to keep going back to your town constantly whenever you got the farm expired warning and repeatedly right clicking. It got really, really frustrating. So I'll just add a whole bunch of farms to our queue. And I'll add more. It's always good to add uh, more farms to the Reese queue. Now you, go chop wood. And in fact, do we have enough for this? Yes, we do. Okay, I'll get the double bit axe, which will help us chop wood faster. We have quite a few military units here already. We have an archery range and a stable already built from the beginning. And we have a blacksmith. A blacksmith is, uh, yes, it's a building purely focused around technologies. The blacksmith lets you research upgrades that increase infantry or archer attack and infantry, archer, and cavalry armor. So, very useful to um, invest a little bit in those if you're planning on fighting and you two are not doing anything. Yeah. Uh, is there gold nearby? Not really. However, so, let's get into the real meat of this scenario. This here, with that very nice sound, this is a relic. Relics just basically sit here and don't do very much. When the guy was saying that the first relic is close to our town, he was not kidding. It's very, very close. Relics can only be carried by monks, and, and conveniently, we've got a couple of monks right here. So, this is a monk. If we move them, You'll notice that monks are very, very slow, and I mean really slow. Really, really slow. They also have practically non-existent HP. It's uh, less than a villager, actually, believe it or not. No armor, and yeah, they're extremely fragile. But, as the awesome narrator was saying, monks can heal injured units. Monks, in general, have three main functions. Healing injured units, converting enemy units, and picking up relics. They are in fact the only unit that can collect relics, so let's go ahead and right click this relic here after that interesting symbol goes off it, and once we have a relic... Good! You have a relic! Protect the relic in the monastery by right clicking the monastery. So, uh, you can garrison relics inside monasteries the same way you garrison units inside other buildings for protection. So, just right click the monastery, and you'll notice that um, my monk... Wait, normally appear outside of the building that created them. You can have your units move to a spot once they're created. You already explained gather points. points. Uh, yeah. You now have one relic garrison. Relics garrisoned in your monastery will slowly add gold to your stockpile. If to you set a gather wait. point for inventory, click your barracks, click Now, if you look closely point, at our gold indicator, you'll see it's going up at a rate of about one gold per second. Gather. Having relics is a pretty nice benefit. They slowly give you an infinite source of gold. They're in fact the only source of gold when um, all gold on the map is mined out, so they're actually very useful that way. Well, actually, there's another source of gold. You might notice a farm just expired there, but the villager is now automatically replanting it. Very soon that one will expire, but yeah, you get the idea about replanting farms. And you two are still doing nothing. Oh wait, I was going to toss them some gold when I found it. Actually, you scouts, go ahead and scout. Hopefully there's some gold around here. But if not, I am I get this feeling this mission is going to require us getting gold through other means. Firstly, you the relic. You can use the technology tree to see what technologies and upgrades you can research. Click the technology tree button in the upper right corner of the screen to see the tree for your civilization. Ah, the technology tree. Okay, I thought I'd only have to explain this in the next scenario, but let's check this out. The technology tree is actually kind of complicated, so I probably won't be explaining much of it here. But basically, you can have a look at everything here, what leads into what. So, as you can see here, the barracks connects to the archery range and the stable. This means you actually do need to build a barracks before you can build either of those two. And you can see what units go there, and the unit upgrade tree. So, for example, after men at arms, swordsmen can become long swordsmen, two-handed swordsmen, and champions. It's sorted by age, as you can see the ages right there. You'll also see what technologies you have access to, and, uh, you know, things of that nature. Now, you might notice there are a couple of things here that have giant X's on them. Yep. An X means your civilization cannot research that technology or train that unit at all. So if you take note here, this means that Celtic 
um, that's the civilization we're playing as, the Celts, their archers can only go up to crossbowmen. They cannot reach the final stage in their upgrade line. They also can't get hand cannoneers at all, and these two archery range technologies are also inaccessible. But we have access to the full pikemen and swordsman trees. The civilization we're playing as is mostly an infantry based one, so yeah, you'll want to keep that in mind. That's all I'll mention uh, about that for the time being. Now, we found some gold there, so let's go ahead and get you two um, stupid villagers right there and uh, go build a mining camp and start mining. Sheep, you get over... Um... You know, funny thing about sheep, there are some people who actually use sheep to scout in multiplayer games. They have a pathetically small line of sight, but at least they're kind of expendable because, well, admittedly, if you let your enemy get them, they are, you are giving them free food. Yeah, if a sheep... The sheep basically go under the control of whoever um, first sees them, and they can change control if an enemy unit goes up to one of yours. The Celts are actually better at guarding sheep than most other civilizations. If one of their... If more than one unit is within line of sight of a sheep, sheep will not be stolen from, um, from them. So actually, it's... They're pretty good at that. So... Let's see what we can do. I think our next step would be to build a market. Okay, where are you? You there? Do we have enough wood for a market? Let's place that we have enough wood. Now, I believe that the... Yes, the mill is a prerequisite for both farms and a market. So, you actually really do want to build a mill. Uh, if only because farms are actually very useful. Another farm. Got out. Let's add a couple more farms to the queue. Now, we can't actually do anything in our monastery. The reason for that is, technically speaking, you're not supposed to have a monastery until the castle age. It's then that you can actually produce more monks, and also research monk upgrade technologies. There are a lot of very interesting upgrades for monks, but... Anyway. Okay, this market's going up. While we're waiting, we might as well research uh, forging to increase the attack power of our infantry. Speak it. Infantry, better station them around there. Actually, let's see. Hmm. Okay, I do kind of want to create more units, and you know what, uh, we've got huge surpluses of... Yep, thought they'd be a catch! Alright, need more houses. Okay, houses, more houses, more houses. One, two, three. That should probably do us for the time being. And yes, more... Okay, market's market finished. can create trade cards to generate extra gold. You can also exchange one resource for another at the market for a small fee. Click the market, then click sell food for gold. Well, we do have surplus food, so we might as well. So, market. The market is a purely economic building, and it's very, very interesting. The market can create trade cards, which cost 100 wood and 50 gold, and they're useful for trading with allies, which we'll get into in a bit. The market, however, is... You really, 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 really want to build one of these in a team game, which this one just happens to be. Why? This technology right here. Cartography. This is... I just realised that I've got a couple of villagers here that aren't doing anything. I'll just build a couple more farms. Often a good idea to have some farms around your town centre. Okay, another villager right there. You go chop more wood. I think we need more wood chopping duty. You go up there. And when this is finished... Okay, you go chop wood. Right, as I was saying... This technology, cartography, this is one of the biggest, best investments you can make in a game where you have allies. This says, you and your allies share the same line of sight. You see what they see and vice versa. This is not enabled by default, you need this. This technology is so useful that the Forgotten expansion actually made it free. Yeah, if we click this, and wait for it to be researched, You'll see a dramatic change in the map after we've done this, believe me. This is very, very awesome. The market also lets you buy and sell resources. I guess I can talk about this while I'm waiting for cartography. Now, yes, the numbers there will show you how much gold you'll get for each lot of 100 resources. You'll notice that you do get ripped off a little bit. Now, buying and selling resources at the market follows a basic supply and demand model, and I'm probably going to get interrupted because cartography is about to be researched and I really want to be around to explain what that does. Okay, just you wait. This is awesome, believe me. Look! 
see? Weaken, that was a lot less awesome than I expected. Usually your allies have a lot more stuff, but anyway. We can now see everything our allies see. They've got a couple of villages, a blacksmith, a bunch of buildings, and a whole set of walls around their town. So, that's actually really nice. They also have their own market. If we click this market here, you'll see there's a gold indicator there. This says, yes, gold available by trading here. This means that every trip a trade cart makes towards this market, it'll get you 21 gold. So yes, that's how trading works, but to trade we need a trade card. Trade carts are a type of unit produced at the market, as you'll see when I click this. But first I just want to explain briefly that supply and demand thing. Basically, the more you sell resources at the market, the less gold you'll get for them. However, the less gold you'll need to pay to buy that resource later. It, ref it works the opposite way if you sell. I mean, if you, if you buy. If you buy resources, then it'll start costing more to buy them. However, you'll be able to sell those resources for more as well. So yes. And I'm not entirely sure which resource we're running low on, so I guess I'll just, yeah. So, let's create a trade card and get it to work. Now, I can actually set the gather point right on the allied market so that my trade cart will immediately start trading the moment it's produced. So that's cool. While we're waiting, we might as well, uh, you know what, let's get some more archers. In fact, wait a minute, cancel that. I'm gonna get some skirmishes. I'm actually gonna need to get quite a few skirmishes because the, the English, they're big fans of archers, and that's, that means that skirmish is going to be very useful against them. You made a trade. If you click the trade card on your allies' market, you can make extra gold. Your trade card will automatically make trips between your and your allies' markets. <laughs> what the trip? <laughs> that trade card was going back. <laughs> Well, that was interesting. I've never seen that happen before. <laughs> Moonwalking trade card. <laughs> okay, okay. In all honesty, your allies', your allies gate will all automatically open for you. City's doing. Your allies' gate will open automatically for you. We have enough soldiers now to think about attacking the English and recovering their relic. Okay, I did not realize I had that many already. But anyway, your trade cart will um, hopefully stop moonwalking. <laughs> oh my god, that was hilarious. Oh, I can't believe I got something like that on camera. <laughs> oh, wow, I still can't get over that. But anyway. If you're getting ready to attack the English, I can help you out. Here, take this food and wood. And the other nice thing about allies is that sometimes allies will give you resources. And in fact, you can give resources to them. If you click on this, uh, I believe it's... No, it's not. Yes, it is diplomacy. Now, here, this lets you actually give resources to your allies. You can actually send resources to your enemies too. If you're wondering why you'd ever want to do that, there are times in certain campaigns later on when someone starts as an enemy but will become an ally if you, let's say, pay them enough gold. So, yeah, that's kind of what that's for. But anyway, you can give give your allies resources. Now, the annoying thing is, though, it actually costs a little bit to do this. The game kind of rips you off. Basically, if you, let's say, try and send the ally 100 wood, Notice how I now have 130 less wood in my stockpile. A small percentage is deducted as a quote-unquote trading fee. It's annoying, really annoying. Clear tributes. Really, really annoying. But, you can help that by, if you research coinage at the market, this reduces the tribute fee to 20% rather than 30% like it was before. There's a later technology you can research that makes it completely free, and that is very, very useful. But anyway, this thing's going to keep making trips, but for now, we want to send a monk over into our allies' town. Remember when they said that uh, our allies had a relic? Well, yeah, let's go. Again, allied gates will automatically open for you, unless your ally has specifically chosen to lock their gates. Now, yes, you can lock and unlock gates yourself, by selecting a gate. We'll find that out when we have gates later on. 
but suffice to say, you actually will want to lock your gates if uh, you're worried about an enemy attack, because that short window of opportunity, well, that, that short moment when that gate is open, enemies can slip through. And this is a tactic that can actually work a few times against the really stupid AI who don't realize it's happening. But yes, you might want to lock your gates when the enemy is coming, because otherwise your own units could accidentally open the gates and let the enemy through, so kind of not want to do that. Anyway. Forgetter. Welcome. If you've come for the relic, you can find it on the hill to the northeast of our town. And this is in fact the only time in the entire William Wallace campaign where someone other than the narrator speaks. Yes, really. So, our monk's going to go up on this hill, and for the time being, let's just see if we can... Oh, we've run out of um, the reseed farm queue. Yeah, this is what you have to. This is the. This is what you have to do to reset it manually. Yeah, that got really annoying. Yeah, be thankful we're playing the conquerors. We haven't upgraded to men at arms yet. Seriously, might actually get a couple of scout cavalry just to make sure. Okay, our relic is there. Go pick up the relic. Come on. Yes, monks are extremely so. Is that a? I saw a wolf in those woods. Hmm. Yeah, wolves are random wild animals that will attack uh, your villagers or other yeah. units on site, so you'll want to watch out for wolves. They're no match for military units, but yeah. villagers can actually die to them if you're not careful. Okay. Researching loom helps protecting your villagers from wolves too. Oops, I... stupid, I placed that wrong. Actually, if I delete that, I get the resources back, I believe, and I can replace the foundation. If you delete a building after it's already finished construction, you don't get any resources back. You're, it's too late to opt out. So, we've got a sizable army here. Did he just say that again? Anyway. Okay, we've got another relic incoming. And, you know what? When I start the attack, I'm going to send a monk over there. Where are my scouts? There you are. Okay, firstly, let's see if we can find the English. Now, I pretty much know where they are already. Let's just check. Yep, they are th down this river, I believe. Normally, your allies will have explored areas of the map like this for you, and researching cartography will... Okay, they have a... Yep. Okay. You know what? Hey, archers. Come on, follow me. Follow me. Follow me out of the safety of your town. I really hope they don't actually reach my... Okay, let's see if I can... Get it form a trap for those archers. Let's see if they are still following me. I don't think they are. But anyway. You now have uh, two relics garrisoned. Bring back one more and you'll be victorious. Yes, you really do want to focus on getting more relics because relics are quite helpful in standard games. If you have all the relics on the map under your control, that's one of the ways to win a match in a, in a, in a regular game. You'll have to hold the relics for a certain amount of time and all of your enemies will get a gigantic notification saying WARNING YOUR ENEMY HAS ALL THE RELICS and will be told where all their monasteries are so they can focus on destroying them. It is pretty tough to hold those relics, you probably want to spread them out in different monasteries rather than put all your eggs in one basket as you're forced to here. Also, can you can you tell if a monastery has a relic in it by us. if it has a flag on the Lights top of the, the monastery. That means there's a relic. If you have any spare soldiers, come to our town and let's drive the English... Aha! Okay! Tribute your ally, click the diplomacy button in the upper right corner of your screen. Give your allies some food and gold, but don't give them everything you own. Okay, so we're supposed to give some our allies some food. You know what? I was planning on doing this before. Let's see. You know what? I'll go ahead and give you 500 because I'm just that nice of a guy. Well, if I'd accidentally said that to the, to the English, that would have been hilarious, but uh, anyway. Now, I'm sending my monk over here with these troops. If everything works out well, I might be able to show off conversion. Hopefully. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's see if I can get... If I can get that knight, that would be very nice. Although, probably everything's going to be dead by then. That knight is not moving. Okay. Let's see if I can get the knight. Okay, everyone stand down. Stand down, stand down, stand down. He's dead. No, he's not. Did I get him? Yes, I got him. Right. So, this is how conversion works. And hey, that worked perfectly. So, you, you work for me now. Here. 
Yes. So, you go and heal him. Right. Yes! This knight used to belong to the enemy! He's now on my side! Monks cannot attack, but they can do something potentially even more awesome. They can convince enemies to join your side. The problem with that is that um, enemy units will very, very quickly focus on killing monks if they get wind that you're trying to convert them, but if they don't see it coming, or in cases like this where they were kind of stupid... Yep, we now have a knight in an age before we, have, we would normally have access to them. Converting units is very interesting, however, there's a few things you need to keep in mind about it. Units that are converted will keep the stats they had while they were in under your enemy's control. And those stats will not change. They will upgrade if you research an upgrade for them. For example, if I managed to get to the Imperial Age and upgraded my knights to cavaliers, this guy would become a cavalier. At least I'm pretty sure he would. However, if I had converted a knight after I had already upgraded to cavaliers, the upgrade would not apply to him. He would be stuck as a knight, as a regular knight forever. But the other thing is, notice how my regular units here... Okay, let's see. Uh, yes. My Scout Cavalry here have plus three attack. Plus two from their regular Feudal Age bonus, but plus one from researching Forging. This knight would normally get plus one attack from Forging, but he doesn't have it here. That's because, like I said, converted units keep their exact stats from when they were under the enemy's control. Because the enemy had not researched Forging, this knight does not benefit from it. So that's kind of annoying. On the plus side, if your enemies have better technology than you, the converted units will have better stats. But, yeah, it's kind of something you have to live with. Anyway, I'm really glad I actually got to show off conversion, because normally it's really hard. I didn't think I'd be able to do that. That's actually pretty cool. Lots of surprises in this one. Anyway. Uh, I'm gonna have my monk keep healing here. You can actually yeah. choose a specific unit you want to heal, but often they just, their regular AI will prioritize healing whatever needs it the most, so it's actually pretty good. Now, remember what I said before about when you group units in formation, everything moves at the speed of the slowest unit? Yeah. This is something you really need to keep in mind if you've got monks with you, because the moment you include a monk in a formation, this happens. Yep, everything slows to a crawl. Yep. The plus side is the monk is kind of protected. The bad side is, well, yep. He's severely slowing down his comrades. If you want any semblance of speed in your army, move everything first and then move the monks. But anyway. And my trade cart still going at it. I'm gonna keep my monk in the rear just so I can heal anyone and see if I can make a couple of new convert. Hey, you guys are still outside the gate! <laughs> Remember that scout that came here? Well, he has brought friends! Now you all die. Okay, there's a knight there as well. Okay, I probably should have brought some spearmen. Hey, let's see if I can convert this guy. Oh, he's gonna die first, isn't he? Nope, he died first. And he died before I could convert him. Oh, well. <laughs> Anyway, the oh, what? Oh, wow, sneak attack, sneak attack, sneak attack. That is very bad. This monk is in extreme danger. He's probably going to die, actually. Everyone protect the monk. Monk is dead. Yes. Well, that's certainly bad. You, skirmishers, focus on the archers. And wow, my knight is still alive here. Knights are extremely powerful, by the way. You want to make very good use of them wherever you can. And things are looking actually kind of bad for us. Uh, hmm. Okay, right. Let's actually pull back and retreat for a bit. Provided you don't all die on your way out. Okay, that's a lot of crossbowmen and uh, stuff. Okay. Hey, let's see if I can pull back to... Okay, right. This might end very badly. Let's get some spearmen now that I know that they're using knights against us. And let's get some more skirmishes for their archers. And some more of uh, these guys. Okay, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? Okay, you're all slowly getting picked off. Uh... Okay, monks? Monks, get that knight. That knight will work for me, whether he likes it or not. Come on! No, don't you dare kill- Yes! He's on our side now! Great! And I didn't lose any of my monks. So that's actually pretty cool. I now have two knights. 
Now, technically speaking, you would want to advance the Castle Age at this point, but they really explain how to do that in the next scenario, so yeah. I'm going to save that until then. More spearmen, because those knights are absolutely nasty, and more skirmishes, and I'm not going to have enough population slots, am I? Anyway, uh, is everyone healed? What's that red dot doing there? Uh-oh, my trade card is under attack! Right then, okay, uh, cavalry! One cavalry should be enough to finish that guy off. Go and take him out before things end badly for my trade card. Okay, actually, or this guy will get stuck against my allies' walls. Hey, he didn't manage to slip in. Now, he could slip in if those, this goes badly. And he didn't. Okay, you, cavalry, get him! Okay, he's down. Great. Now, back to base. Oh, uh, lost a farm. Oh, wow. Lost lots and lots of... Okay. If you wait way too long to, rep to replenish a farm, and this is why I kind of like to do this, once I have enough wood, if you wait way too long to replenish a farm, the farm will just completely vanish, so you really don't want that to happen. They're still going on the wood, and uh, everything is probably fine and dandy for the time being. I probably don't want to risk my monks any further, though. And hey, it's got into this part of the music. I haven't really talked about the music in this game that much. Basically, it plays a loop of several different songs, and uh, yeah, you're hearing this song now. Weird thing about this song. It seems hilarious now, but this song used to scare me when I was a kid. Yeah, I used to mute the soundtrack whenever this song came on. I really did. I would just mute my computer speakers because this song actually scared me as a kid. I... yeah. I mean, I understand. I was scared by the Pokemon Tower theme as a kid. That makes sense. Oddly enough, Lavender Town itself never scared me. The Pokemon Tower theme did, but the Lavender Town music never did. This song, for some reason, was like that. It just scared me. I don't know why. It just did. There is another song in this game's soundtrack, however, and we probably won't get to it in this scenario. Once we do get to it, I will definitely point it out. Because that song horrifies me, even now. Oh god, just thinking of it sends shivers down my spine. There's another song in this soundtrack that contains exactly one part that I find, even today, utterly terrifying. But, yeah. Okay, we probably have enough of an army now. A couple more spearmen, a couple more skirmishers. Yeah, I apologize for this, but okay. By the way, let's get some better armor. Researching scale mail armor will obviously improve the defenses of your infantry. Scale barding armor improves the defenses of your cavalry. And yeah. Okay, you guys, everyone. Move out. Attack phase two. Hopefully this will be a little better. Uh, that guy's... Oh, actually, he's not... Okay. I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna, uh, get some more, uh, soldiers back at base for a moment, just in case I need to replenish my losses. So, yeah, just in case. Always pays to be, uh, to be careful. Now, I'm gonna take control of my skirmishes for a second here, just in case I need to get, I'm saying just in case a lot. Hi, archers! Actually, cavalry are fairly decent against archers, so you attack them. Knights, knights, I said knights! Go there! You can, oh, I forgot, you can double-click to select all uh, units of a certain type. So, for example, if I double-click on one of my skirmishes here, I select all my skirmishes. That's pretty cool. And it looks like, I don't want to speak too soon, but their defenses are kind of down. Problem is, you're really meant to use siege weapons to breach stone walls. Uh, this is going to take a very, very long time with just... We're trying to knock down a stone wall with swords. It's going to take a very long time. So all of you, yep, and of course, um, I'm probably going to cut to when this is gone, because seriously, uh, this is, well, uh, yeah, going to take ages. Uh, again, we'll learn about siege weapons in the next scenario, but trust me, you generally want to use siege weapons to take out things like this. Oh, this is going to take forever. Swordsmen actually get a very, very slight attack bonus against buildings, but really, that is only there just to make sure that it doesn't take for freaking ever, it's, and it still takes for freaking ever. Hey, you, go explore while I'm bored. 
Oh, I just realized we need a monk to go over there for the relic. Uh, you'll stay back there until the coast is clear. Let's see. Okay, houses. They have a market. Now, funny thing is, you can actually trade with enemy markets in this game. You probably don't want to, though, because the enemy will attack you on... Oh, they have another gate here. I actually didn't know that. Because the enemy will attack you on site, and uh, that includes trade units. So, yeah. Trading with neutral markets is fine. They, they will not attack you on site. But enemies will, and uh, you really don't want that, especially for your valuable trade cards. So... Yeah, you can trade with enemy markets, but good luck doing it, trust me. It's very, very hard to do that without your trade cart getting totally slaughtered. Wow, the monk's not even here yet. Uh, come on, wall, you know you want to die. 100. 250. If you can't tell, I'm bored. Okay, this music scared me as a kid too, but, um... That's a little more understandable. Come on. Come on. Goodbye, Gates! Right, now don't you auto-attack the rest of the walls, because we'll be here for years if you do that. Okay, let's get in here. They have a barracks and an arch range. Normally, you want to destroy those things as soon as you possibly can, but here, they're not really focusing on training any more soldiers, so I'm not going to do that. Also, if you know what's good for you, do not attack the enemy villages or their town centre. The moment you start to attack their villages, they will ring the town bell, and that will cause serious problems for you, because you're going to get shot by a lot of arrows. So instead, we've got to follow the path here, and uh, actually, it's my monk who needs to do that, so yeah. Let's follow, and there is our target, the relic. So, Monk, you want to go in there? Now, if we were feeling kind of mischievous, we could just, uh... Okay, you guys just go ahead and smash that. Just to give yourselves something to do. Gotta keep yourselves busy, after all. If we were feeling particularly evil, we could just start converting their villages one by one. Always funny to do that, but, um... For now, we'll just focus on getting the relic and getting out. Hopefully they don't go all town bell on us, because that would be very bad. Oh, those guys are already heading to the... No, they're not. Okay, I'll get it. No, 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 don't you pursue. Do not pursue. Do not pursue. Okay, for now, we're going to put everyone on no attack stance. Reason for this is the moment that we start um, pursuing them to the town centre, they're going to go into the town centre and start reading that. They already have, haven't they? Uh, I don't think they have. Okay, good. They're going to start ringing that town bell, and we do not want that, because our monk is going to get his head full of arrows if that happens. So... Get the relic, get out. Said, get the relic, and go, get out. No, not to the town centre, to the monastery. Anyway, uh, yes. Yeah, combat stances, we'll learn about those a little bit more later, and after our monk is in the clear. Something funny about this, you'll notice that the monk's description now says monk with relic. Uh, yeah. For some reason, Monk with Relic is considered a totally separate unit type to regular Monks. And you know what makes that so hilarious? Well... Because it's considered a totally separate unit type, units that cause bonus damage against Monks do not cause bonus damage against Monks carrying Relics. Yeah, that was fixed in the Forgotten expansion, which like took them like, what, 14 years? But, yeah. So, Scout Cavalry do not do effective damage against Monks with... This guy has an enormous line of sight with that relic, I just realised. Seriously. Well, I guess you need to know if an enemy is about to attack a Monk that has a relic and you're not doing anything. Okay. So, now that Monk is in the clear, go back on aggressive stance. This will mean that they attack any enemy units on sight and will not stop pursuing them until the enemy is dead. Mwahahahaha! <laughs> That guy has taken a lot of spears to the back and is still surviving. Wow. Out of love. Except he's now backing himself into a wall. Yeah. And he's not so immune to swords. <laughs> uh, the moment we start doing this, they're going to ring the town bell, aren't they? Our monk is almost back, so we're pretty much almost won this. Don't really care what happens down there. About to win. Come on, get that relic in. Congratulations. You've captured all three relics.
What? That was weird. With the three relics now locked away safely in Scottish churches, men murmur that we are blessed by the heavens. Our army now stands a chance as we prepare for the final clash with the English. Scotland now has archers and knights of our own with which to meet Longshanks. We march south to Falkirk, where we will rendezvous with the army of William Wallace and plan our combined attack upon the English castle. Okay, I think that achievement kind of glitched out a little bit. I'm guessing it treated my allies as people I won against as well, and because they were the Celts, I got that foe of the Celt achievement. Weird. Very, very weird. I don't see how that happened. But anyway, there's only one thing left. Next time, we take on the final scenario of the tutorial campaign. See you all then. And now it's time for... Ye old f Ah, oh, dang it. The Monk. Monks are some of the most interesting and most complicated units in this game, and they might take a little explaining. I already pretty much showed off the three main things they can do in this video itself, so I'll just uh, rehash again and try and maybe go into a little more detail. Monks generally do three things. Well, actually, before I talk about that, I'll just talk about their them generally stat-wise. Monks, as I mentioned, are exceedingly frail. They have less health than a villager and no armor. They're also incredibly slow and can't defend themselves if attacked in melee. In fact, they can't defend themselves at all. Well, there is one way they can sort of defend themselves, but they usually dead before they get a chance to do it, so yeah. Monks are extremely frail and should be protected at all times. However, they are very, very valuable units to have. Like I was saying, monks mainly do three things. One, heal injured units. This is a big one. Now, apart from monks, the only other way to heal units is to garrison them all inside a building like a castle and just wait them there until they heal. But yeah, monks allow for quick healing on the field at any time, and that can be really, really helpful. The second thing is monks pick up relics, and they are the only units that can do so. And that means you probably in a standard game definitely need to use monks at least once, because yeah, in a standard game, if a side manages to capture all the relics and hold them for a certain amount of time, then they, can, then they win the game. And... If you want to stop this, your best bet is to capture one of the relics, even only one, before an enemy does. It's better to let your enemy get all the relics but one, than to let them get all of them. Because if they do get all of them, then, well, yep, they're kind of on the way to victory there. But if you, if, as long as you have only one relic, you will guarantee that your enemies cannot win by relic victory. So, that is very, very important. Not only that, but relics are the only source of gold in the game, apart from selling resources at the market and trading, when all gold on the map has been exhausted. So that is actually really useful too. So yeah, now of course, normally you have to wait until the castle age to create monks, and that means that generally speaking, if you find a relic while exploring the map, you usually don't, won't be able to actually get it until the castle age. But oftentimes it's a good idea to at least station troops near it until then, at least to protect to prevent your enemy from getting it. Of course, if you've got troops stationed over there and you don't realize an enemy monk is coming, they can cause some serious chaos. Because of the third thing that monks do, and probably the most interesting, is converting enemy units. I said before that monks can't really technically defend themselves. Well, they sort of can, but um it's all really a matter of whether it succeeds before they get killed. Basically, if you right-click on an enemy unit, just like you would normally to attack, instead of attacking, the monk moves into range, and their range is quite large, uh, mind you, and will begin to attempt to convert the enemy. Conversion takes quite a while, and very often, if the monk isn't protected, they'll probably be dead before it can actually finish. However, it is well worth the wait. Once an enemy is converted, they completely switch over to your side to all intents and purposes. You can control them, they will fight for you, they will do anything you ask. This is extremely good. After all, why kill your enemies when you can actually use them to your advantage? 
it's just, again, kind of hard to do without actually protecting the monk, and usually you'll only be able to convert one or so units at a time, because after a monk converts into enemy units, the monk has a sort of a power um, meter, and after it's made a successful conversion, the power meter will drop to 0%, and you'll have to wait for it to recharge back to 100% before you can actually attempt to convert again. So, this prevents you from just totally spamming conversions, just converting an entire army, but... Anyway, conversion is useful for quite a few things. Again, it helps you build up your army, and hey, it's actually better than killing the enemies, because this way, your enemy loses the unit, but you actually get it. So... Pretty awesome, that. Secondly, if you manage to convert a couple of units that are in the middle of an enemy formation, they'll suddenly be treated as enemies to those on your enemy side, and your enemies will now be busy... Um, their automated AI will start attacking the unit that you just converted, and you could really, really screw up a tight formation by doing this. Like, everyone will just suddenly break ranks to kill the traitor, it's quite hilarious, and... And it often really slows down the momentum of an attack. The other cool thing about converting is, like I mentioned in this video, they keep any upgrades that the enemy researched. Of course, the flip side here is they don't benefit from your upgrades, so if you're better than your enemy technologically, conversion usually doesn't really help you that much. And the other interesting thing about, well not interesting thing, the other cool thing about conversion is it'll let you get access to your enemy's unique units. Unique units are something that we'll be mentioning in the next scenario, but suffice to say, every civilization has one unit, well at least one, some have two, that no other civilization has access to, unless they convert them. I always used to love in uh, random games I was playing as a kid to just um, <laughs> wait for the enemy to attack me with unique units, just convert a couple of them, and then build up a unique unit collection. <laughs> kind of funny that, but anyway. Now, conversion does have its limits. Monks at first can't convert enemy monks. They also can't convert buildings or siege weapons. However, there are technologies you can research at the monastery that allow monks to actually do that. There are still some buildings though that monks can't convert. You can't convert town centers or castles or walls. I'll talk more about the kind of things you can't convert when I get on that technology a bit later, but yeah, there are a few limitations. Just to warn you, converting buildings, you usually very rarely get a chance to actually do that, because it's a lot harder than you might think, and it's often not worth it. But converting other monks can be useful sometimes. Speaking of monk upgrades, basically, monks are produced at the monastery, and every single upgrade pertaining to monks is available there, and monks have a wide variety of extremely interesting and unique upgrades. And I'll probably talk about those a lot later once we start actually seeing them, because some of them are really unique, and it is kind of cool. Again though, if you're planning on using a lot of monks, be prepared to have a lot of gold. Not only do monks cost gold to create, monk technologies usually run you a lot of gold too. Now, if you are going to go for monks, there are a couple organizations that actually tend to be better at using monks than others. The main ones are the Aztecs and the Spanish, which is kind of ironic considering that, well, yeah, they're the ones pretty much at each other's throats throughout the entirety of that campaign, which we won't be getting to for quite some time, but anyway, kind of ironic there, but yes. Spanish actually have a special type of monk that's a little different from the norm though, and we'll get into that once we uh, get into that, which is much later. But anyway, that's monks for you. And now it's time for the history lesson. Religion was a powerful force during the Middle Ages, whether it was Roman Catholicism in the West, Islam in the Middle East, or Buddhism in Asia. The missionaries and teachers of religion were mainly monks, men who took vows of poverty and who dedicated their lives to spreading their message. Middle Age conflicts often derived from religious differences and were led or supported by contingents of monks on each side. The Crusades, for example, were multiple attempts by European Christians to wrest control of the Holy Land from the, the hands of Islamic Arabs. Large numbers of monks accompanied the Christian crusading armies, and you might want to make a note of that because that actually is going to be helpful to know in one of the later campaigns, but for the time being, I'll see you next time.